So here I am at the Chelsea Flower Show and I'm about to go and investigate the House Park Studios. Let's go and find out what's going on. Hello, I'm your host Jane Perrone and this is the podcast about all things indoor gardening and this week I meet some of the creators of the Houseplant Studios at the world famous Chelsea Flower Show in London, finding out what these exhibits are all about and how they're showcasing houseplants in various different ways. And if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, is it Friday already? Don't panic. It is Thursday. If you're listening on the day of publication of this episode, I'm just publishing a little bit early because the Chelsea Flower Show is happening right now. So this is rushing to your ears. I spent this Monday, just gone, the 20th of May 2024, at the Chelsea Flower Show. And I made a beeline as soon as I got there at 8am sharp for the Houseplant Studios. For the last few years, this has been the spot where those who don't have outdoor gardens or maybe just love to garden inside can see what is possible in the world of displaying houseplants. Now, if you listened to last year's Chelsea Flower Show episode, you'll remember that I was a little bit disappointed by the standard. The studios were okay, but they were a bit pedestrian on the whole. So it was of great interest to me to see how this year compared. And I have to say, on the whole, I thought they were much more interesting. And in this episode, I'm going to bring you some audio from my favourite houseplant studios, kicking off with Verdant Visions. This was created by James Whiting, a.k.a. Plants by there. Now, if you love the 1970s, I was born in the 1970s, so I was actually there. You will be blown away by this confection of beautiful classic house plants that we loved in the 1970s, plus an orange backdrop, retro tech like wonderful old stereos, and even an avocado bathroom suite. Now, we didn't have one of these. Ours was a sort of a amazing shade of peachy pink. But yes, if you were around at that period, 70s and 80s, you will know what I'm talking about. And in fact, they're coming back into fashion, apparently. And other amazing 70s pieces all put together by James, who wasn't actually alive in the 1970s, but clearly understands the vibe. I'll have to say, Based on my parents' house in the 1970s, I think this was probably a more stylish vision than theirs. There wasn't as much brown as there was in my parents' house, but I thought this was beautifully done. It's very James. He has a particular style, but he did manage to make it different from his previous houseplant studios. And indeed, this one best houseplant studio and a gold medal from the judges. So let's hear from James about how he developed this vision of 1970s plantiness. And why not pull up the show notes at janeperone.com while you're listening to have a look at some images of the Houseplant Studios. James Whiting, we're here at your Houseplant Studio, which hasn't disappointed in the colour stakes, as always. (laughs) Tell me about this creation. So, for me, I wanted to create something with everyday houseplants that we've known for decades. Um, Plants that are really nostalgic, give you memories of your grandparents and your aunties and uncles and your childhood. Um, And I wanted it to appeal to the Chelsea audience, um, because I think, you know, retro houseplants are very back now. Um, They're very affordable. They're a great introduction to indoor gardening for for beginners. Um, And they're available absolutely everywhere. Absolutely. And the colour theme is bright. We've it's got bright. an orange studio. We've got an avocado bathroom suite, which I'm loving. Uh, tell us about the colour choices. This is a, a sort of a hat tip to the 1970s. Yes, definitely. Um, so, you know, orange is my colour, for sure. Um, and once you put greenery against orange, the plants just ping. They just really stand out. Um and, you know, people are decorating their homes with really vibrant colours now. They're, they're less scared and we're stepping away from beige and grey. Um, and, you know, 
house plants are not beige and grey. There's so many colours within them. You look at the, you know, the leaf patterns on these retro plants, and there's red and yellow and touches of orange and cream, and it's very, very vibrant. So, you know, mix the two together, and you get this seventies vision. And you've got, you really have got some classics here. Obviously, you've got the Swiss cheese plant, Monstro Delicioso. You've also got uh, lovely things like the Affalandra, which you don't yes. see very much. The zebra plant. Um, and what else can I see? Oh, Diefenbachia we've got. Of course, spider plants. Any other favourites here? Um, actually, I mean, I refer to them as a croton, but I'm sure, yep. you know, people have many names for them. I've never really liked these. <laughs> but I think working on this project, I thought I can't not use them. And actually, I'm starting to appreciate them in a different way. Mm-hmm. I think I've always seen them as something that's been a bit tricky in a commercial environment when you're doing indoor plant displays. But... Uh, in your home I think you can monitor it more closely and give it the conditions it needs and it's a pop of colour but it's still a foliage plant it's amazing well I wish you luck with this I think it looks stunning and it's certainly going to get people uh, looking you've got plants in disco balls you've got retro stereos and all kinds of retro bits and pieces that I'm absolutely loving Uh, I'm going to put some pictures of this in, in my show notes for people to enjoy because this you have to see uh, as ha- this how many times you've been at chelsea now three this is my third third, third one yeah. well it is a wonderful achievement so well done james and best of luck this week as as show week begins thank you james why is it that whenever you record any audio at the chelsea flower show on press day there's always a street cleaner machine that comes by at just the wrong moment Anyway, I'm sure you caught the gist of what James was saying there. And as I said, do check out the show notes for a full transcript of this episode and lots of images from the show and links to James's Instagram and website. Now, it's worth saying that these houseplant studios have only been in existence at Chelsea for a few years. And it's safe to say that the budgets involved in these projects are way, way smaller than the main avenue Chelsea show gardens and probably the smaller gardens too. Finding sponsors is tough and so that's why it was really ballsy of Gemma Hay aka the plant parlour to go ahead with her houseplant studio without finding a sponsor. She teamed up with Grow Tropicals, the Leeds-based online houseplant seller for this studio but she's raising a lot of the money herself and is estimating that it's going to cost four to five thousand pounds for her contribution for this garden it's entitled hope after humanity and it's all about sustainability so if you're a regular listener you'll probably know that this is a garden that would catch my attention because that's been a regular theme on this podcast too Let me set the scene. It's 2099 and humanity is done for. But the houseplants are thriving. Over to Gemma to explain a bit more. So this houseplant studio has been set at the end of the world. Um, It's been specifically set in the year 2099. And that's because by 2099, scientists estimate that the temperature is going to have increased by at least four degrees centigrade on average in the world. Um, So the problem with that, of course, is that things will go extinct, plants will go extinct, tropical plants will start to thrive in places previously that they hadn't. Uh, So the whole concept of this studio is that humans have caused the end of the world. And though we haven't kind of told anybody how humans have gone extinct, there's definitely suggestion that humans don't live here anymore and plants do. So plants have taken over and all that's left is this lone mannequin in a London boutique. The vision is real here. We've got the ceiling coming down, and there's a big hole in the ceiling here. We've got plants everywhere. I love the little touches. You've got a little beer can crushed on the ground. You've got cotton reels coming out of the haberdashery cabinet. You've really paid attention to the detail here. Um, 
how, why did you decide to go this route rather than just a few pretty house plants? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think for me, um, I'm quite conceptual. I like something that has a good idea and a good message and a good story. Um, I love to kind of curate things. So uh, my background was in museums and I did exhibitions and I love to cu curate things that make people think about the world differently and really challenge people's perceptions. So this whole idea really challenges people uh, to think about sustainability and climate change in a different way. Um, I think it uh, gives them an alternative future, an alternative universe, which actually could become reality if we're not careful. So really it's about um, presenting that in a way that it is beautiful and we're really enjoying nature standing in this and it really smells quite earthy in here. Mm, it smells delicious, I have to say. The, the apocalypse smells great, what can I say? Yeah, I mean, these plants definitely think so and we've got our own kind of little microcultures that have like moved in. We've already got insects in here and everything. So um, it really does feel like the end of the world. Um, but yeah, it's. It, I think it really makes people think about things differently. And this whole concept was very much kind of influenced by the apocalyptic genre, um, in particular the game version of The Last of Us, um, and also, uh, you know, like the Day of the Triffids, for example, where plants rule, take over the world. Um, yes. So. It's really cool. I'm glad to see that Hoya Linearis has survived the apocalypse. We've got that trailing down around this mannequin. Does she or he have a name? What? Who are we? Oh, she is a she. Sorry, she I've just does. seen. I've just seen that it's a, a female yeah, mannequin. Yeah, she does. <laughs> she she has been very affectionately named Flora during this project. Oh, perfect. Flora was living in my garden for a little while before she came here, um, and she is your standard kind of plastic shop mannequin. Uh, but she's been coated with calico um, to try and encourage plants to root and stick to her when she gets wet and obviously at the end of the world when the roof has collapsed you know the rain is just going to pour down on her so she's covered in a bit of mud brick dust algae um, and she's also got a philodendron philodendron scandens uh, climbing around her clothing her uh, because she's not wearing any clothes and the idea behind that is to suggest that she maybe is this imprint that humanity has left she's very human-like and human figured uh, but she very much doesn't move. She's very still. Um, but she, uh, yeah, she she is very much an imprint of humanity. Or possibly even you could interpret she's Mother Nature herself. Oh, very nice. Now, you, anyone who listened to the podcast we, we did a while ago will know that you love your anthuriums. And we do have some anthuriums in here. Uh, tell me how much you're enjoying seeing these lovely, luscious yes, leaves. they're beautiful. Um, so... Grow Tropicals, who I've worked with on this project, uh, do have a huge uh, collection of specimen plants. Uh, they have a grow tent at their Leeds HQ, um, and they have a number of different types of anthuriums and philodendrons and other different plants in there as well, specifically aroids. So they've been able to get hold of um, the Anthurium baluanum uh, for this project, uh, which is kind of like curtaining behind Flora. Um, she's got this kind of beautiful backdrop of huge uh, voluptuous leaves. They are very voluptuous. Which one is that? Is that the, this one here? Uh, with this the, one here, the really big with the, one. With yeah. the interesting sort of look. Oh, it's kind of a... It's kind of a shield, heart-shaped shield, I guess, is the way I, I describe it. It's describe beautiful. It yeah. Um, yeah, there are some really stunning plants in here. I must also mention the sofa, the upholstered sofa with the Cissus discolor and Ficus pumila growing across it. This, I mean, it looks just it's kind of it's shabby chic taken to a whole new <laughs> level isn't it but it looks amazing i can yeah, tell that you've right. got um the eye of somebody who's uh you know studied art and things because this is beautifully done oh thank you so <laughs> much jane and i think that's it you know it's about for me it's about kind of representing a really important concept and having that narrative and storytelling behind it but also doing it in a way which visually um really is quite eye-catching and grabbing and i wanted this display to grab people's attention to be something different and to be a bit unique within the houseplant studios um, you know as an area of Chelsea um, so that people see it and really think wow that's different I've never seen anything like that before well as uh, yeah I have moaned about lack of um edginess and so you brought the edge this is amazing Gemma thank you so much for sharing it with us and best of luck this week thanks so much it'll be interesting to see what happens with the judging they came yesterday but <sighs> Yeah. Watch yeah. this space. <laughs> so the judges awarded Gemma a silver gilt medal for her garden. 
in collaboration with Grow Tropicals. So congratulations to them. What a great achievement. And if you want to see some images of that mannequin and that incredible sofa and more from the studio, do go and visit the show notes. I'm going to keep saying that because lots of people just don't bother, but it's really worth it to see those images. And next up, something completely different, but also glorious. Holly and Nikki are in the garden, a plant shop based in London. They are the planting combo queens, something displayed to perfection in their maximalist verdure houseplant studio. This one was purple and everything in it was absolutely exquisite. So let's find out more about this studio. Holly Barsby and Nicola Barsby, a mother and daughter team designing Chelsea Houseplant Studio. I'm loving that already. Take us on a visual journey via words of what you've created here because it's rather gorgeous. Thank you. So inspired by a Victorian plant star. So we started with the humble uh, Aspidistra and we've gone for a big specimen in the middle. And all the furniture and all the staging is things we have collected over the years and from independent market traders. That's how we started Mm -hmm. our business. Independent shops, we're a high street shop in NW6. So it's very, very personal. And if you're having a little look, there's a couple of photographs of when we first got the shop and little doggy, little doggy bear. So, um, and there's things from home as well, like the little props. So this is our living space, a space that you can come to and relax after a hard day's work and it's set in an apartment west london apartment um, and you've got a little balcony there where you can wander out have that extra outdoor space bring it inside out and outside in and just enjoy plants Mike, Mr. Michael Perry, he's not photobombing, he's audio bombing. <laughs> I'm, Hi, Michael. Say hi to you, Jane. How are you? Are I'm you good, good, thank you. Yeah. I'm good. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. If you haven't talked about it already, talk about Nikki Cam. Nikki that is Cam. iconic. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh, now, I, now I'm intrigued. Okay, yeah. we'll, get, we'll get on to Nikki Cam, but I just want to talk about your wonderful plant selections and the way that you've got a real talent, clearly, for matching containers to the plants within. I'm loving the oxalis and is it Moulinbeckia it there is, in yeah. the in the tin uh, enamel basin, blue and white. That's gorgeous. I'm loving the succulent arrangement in, I guess, what would have been a flower arranging vase. Yeah. Um, that's just gorgeous. I mean, I struggle with this stuff. I'm not very good with detail, but you guys, attention to detail is clearly your middle name because this, everything is perfect in here. Uh, and you've also got just some beautiful ideas that you could take home that succulent container you could do that yourself couldn't you at home yeah and actually even though there is a lot loads of little succulent containers whether you've got one space for one plant why not have a mixed plant arrangement whether it is for a sunny position or shadier position but actually in the studio we've gone for three larger containers there's a pet friendly mixed house arrangement round corner on the marble table shade tolerant bread thin and on our balcony, we've got a big um, euphorbia sunny. and succulent for sunny, so people can yeah. see. So they've got a particular light position. Mm-hmm. Okay, that one. That yeah. kind of style would suit your home. And how is it by you, Nikki? And how is it? Yeah. How is it working as a mother and daughter team? I mean, you must get on pretty well to make this work we through do. the stress of Chelsea. We've always done everything together since you were top, anyway. Yeah. Um, and we have our moments. I'm not yeah. going to deny that. Yeah. Um, but generally, yeah. Just we, move on. We know how yeah. each other work, and we've kind of got slightly different um, jobs to do, don't mm-hmm. we? Different and then we roles. come together towards the end. And it kind of comes good, At the end it? result, we're always on the same page, but we different just have routes different to get methods there. and how yeah. to get there. Yeah. And what would you advise people who are used to plant, planting their house plants individually, one in a pot, in terms of working out what works well together? This is a skill, isn't it? Mm. How, how, some yes. tips on that, please. Well, it is right plant, uh, what's compatible together. Um, same watering requirements. I mean... Obviously, you wouldn't have a, a succulent with, say, a Mullenbeckia. 
Yeah. Um, do you agree? I, I would agree. Yeah, compatible planting, so right light, um, right position. And also the depth as well. You wouldn't put mm. the oxalis in a shallow mantle vase. Um, mantle vases, they don't have um, drainage holes. They've got plenty of drainage um, in oh, it. Oh, yeah, that's a good tip, actually. Yeah, yeah. But- so uh, the water just goes in there and then it does so not the in the roots. So the is different, it so is, it's little it's, but often. That's just about yeah. to say that it is little but often, say like mm-hmm. a shot, shot glass directly onto the soil. Mm-hmm. And if the soil is really compact and aerated with a toothpick or, or a pin, so you can get the little droplets. So Mario doesn't run So you don't want, to, don't want it running off the top and also you don't want to drown it either. Well, I mean, I'm loving this. I'm going to be heading to my nearest junk shop and charity shop looking for those now because those, it just looks amazing. I'll get up some photos from my show notes. I'm just really... We've done a saying, actually. Oh, yeah. Let's have a look at this. So, um, we've done repurpose the past, plant the future. Love it. So, yeah. Absolutely love that message. Charity shop, market, traders, Because um, I'm always, shops. people spend a lot of money on pots and I'm always mm. like, I don't have the budget for that. I need to go to the junk shop, charity shop, and find something, something repurpose something. Yes. Yeah, or something yes. in my cupboard. It's such a great message. Yeah. Uh, well, I really wish you the best of success this week. Thank and you. congratulations on this. This is your first Chelsea. It is. Yeah. Any, any sort of life lessons here? What have you, how have you found it? Um, challenging. It, it's very challenging, just the whole process. Um, I'd say now we're digesting it, getting enjoyable mm. as well. Yeah. Um, the time pressures are crazy the days absolutely disappear preparation is absolutely key yeah yeah, yeah. to try and get a bit of a head start well well yeah. done it's a real triumph Thank and you. uh yes i'm going to be taking lots of photos now please do yeah <laughs> enjoy it thank you so much oh tell me about nikki cam oh, oh. nikki cam okay well, <laughs> Go well, on. well i didn't know myself but i'm normally mm. at the back of the shop in a little dark mm. corner just planting up mm-hmm. um, and I start filming so it's like my view nobody else gets to see and I just follow Nikki my mum around whatever she's doing she might be planting at the back she might be doing window boxes at the front and I just watch her and she doesn't and know it's the back of my head and it's normally the back of mum's head and she's like the stick she's like the gardening stick you don't love really it no one knows who I am yeah. I love well, that I like it yeah. sounds good to me <laughs> And I'm delighted to say that Maximalist Verdure won a gold medal. So well done to Holly and Nikki. And a bit of context. If you don't know who Michael Perry is, he's Mr. Plant Geek. He was the guy who uh, decided to step in to my interview and tell me about Nikki Cam. He's been on the show before himself and is always a fixture at Chelsea. And also referenced was The Stig. This is a character or a, I guess a person from the TV show Top Gear, a car TV show here in the UK. And Stig was known for never revealing his identity and wearing a helmet at all times. And that's where the comparison to Nikki comes in. And our final interview is with Callie Hamilton Stove. Now, if you are a long term listener, you may remember my interview with Callie talking about The Glass House, a charity whose mission is to offer second chances to ex-offenders in the UK via horticulture. It was their first time exhibiting at the Chelsea Flower Show and they too got a gold medal for their wonderful you guessed it, Glass House. My name is Callie Hammerton Stove. I'm one of the founders and managing director of the Glass House. And this is the Glass House Effect, our exhibit at Chelsea. So as you enter, you can see these reclaimed tall gates that are meant to give the feeling of being in an enclosed environment. But as you enter the Glass House, which is this beautiful Malvern Garden Billings Glass House, you can see some of the things that would have been in the prison glass house where we originally worked. Um, some of the second chance plants, we call them, and the women are really keen still. They always, they can't let a plant go. They try to bring them back. So we always have second chance plants. And these are in uh, bean cans, which is what we actually did at the beginning. And seedlings, tea is super important to how we work. We have a lot of tea because we talk a lot. 
and you see the women have crochet covers for some of the plants. So that's something that's really common in prison as well. You can hear the women's voices a little bit. Um, so tell me, tell me what your organisation does for these women. What, what's the, what are the challenges that you're trying to address, and how do you go about your work? So we basically built this around the disused greenhouses that existed in prison, and we wanted to take horticulture and the opportunity to be working with plants and help women learn new skills, grow their confidence, and find a new way of being successful after prison. Um, and we train them. They get a horticulture qualification whilst they're with us. They uh, learn about installing and maintaining plants in the office environment. We actually have an installation and maintenance business that they work in while they're with us. We have a shop and we have a website. And they work. They do absolutely every part of that. They do everything from retail to customer service to shipping and plotting and plant. They do everything. Um, and the whole thing really basically is built. So they learn as much as possible. They leave with confidence. And we help them. Them, make sure that they have the best chance after release. We have a zero percent reoffending rate at this point. That is amazing. I mean, that alone is an incredible statistic and a credit to you. And what is it about working with plants that these women find special? Um, well, so many things. But I think initially, a lot of women have had no experience with plants before they join us. And once they join us, they might be a little nervous or scared or a bit tentative. But once they get to know the plants and they understand what they need, how they work, how to propagate them. You see them like become really adept at um, propagating them and growing them and caring for them and they get the so much benefit from seeing them grow and seeing them develop and even like sending them out to the public they love potting a plant and putting it in a package and sending to someone knowing someone out there is going to really love that plant and enjoy it something they grew and they nurtured that's fantastic and what an amazing setting in this glass house you've got uh, birch cage planters hanging from the trees above this is a beautiful scene I mean who wouldn't want to spend time in here it is really beautiful and very peaceful and I think that's one of the main things about the greenhouses in prison and where we grow generally the women are surrounded by noise and and pressure and, and a lot of conflict in prison generally and this work and our growing facility and in this greenhouse it's a place of peace and it's a place of reflection and where they can really focus on their work and think a little bit let their mind roll a little bit and be be a bit free well it's a fantastic uh, exhibit and well done and um, I'm sure that um, your, your, the, the, peop- the women you're working with past and present will be delighted to see you being represented at Chelsea yeah, this well, they, is fantastic they, they love it, the women are just so pleased to be here and it's been such an inspir- inspiration to be here, thank you so much Kelly thank you I'll say this one last time, those show notes contain the transcript of these interviews plus details of the other Houseplant Studios at Chelsea this year. So do go and check that out at janeperone.com. So what was my overall impression of this year's Houseplant Studios? I thought the standard was definitely higher. And I like the fact that a couple of studios had a really strong message. They weren't just, oh, look at the pretty houseplants. Uh, James Whiting's display was as self-assured as ever. And I can see perfectly well why he won Best in Show for the Houseplant Studios. And it was interesting to see that for the first time, a structure other than a wooden building was used in the case of the glass house, because this hopefully opens the door to a few more different options and ways of displaying houseplants in interesting ways. There are still a few other things I would love to see at Chelsea. One thing that I think would be really great would be a houseplant area within the Great Pavilion. So the Great Pavilion is the giant tent at the middle of the Chelsea showground, which contains the nursery stands. I think it would be great to group together the bromeliads, the cacti and succulents, the begonias and the streptocarpus into one area to make a buzz around those stands where houseplant people can congregate. This worked so well at the Malvern Houseplant Festival earlier this month and I think it would add an extra dimension to Chelsea. And I would emphasise that Chelsea is not the be-all and end-all of the UK show scene. I have to say I really enjoyed Morphin. I thought it was an amazing show. Hampton Court is totally different from Chelsea. There's much more room to move around and 
The Urban Show in Manchester is also an interesting new addition to the RHS show's calendar. So things are changing. I'll actually link in the show notes to a press release about how the RHS is changing its show's schedule. Hampton Court Palace is becoming an every other year event with uh, alternating venues in the in-between years. So in 2026, there'll be a show at Badminton rather than Hampton. So I'll link to that. It's interesting to see how these things are developing. The other thing I'd always say is, you know what? I did this, all of this amazing stuff at Malvern and at the Chelsea Flower Show. But you know what probably was the most fun in the last month to do with plants? Well, it was hosting an open day for the community herb garden that I helped to run and selling loads of plants, talking to people in the local community about plants and the fun I had raising those plants to sell. That is what it's all about, this grassroots activity. No, it's not going to probably get me racing up the social media following charts, but it is enormous fun. And that's what I always remember when I think about these shows is that oftentimes what's happening on a local level, your local show, your local plant fair is just as fascinating and valid as anything that's happening at Chelsea or any other show. And if you don't have a local show or planty event to go to, why don't you start your own? That's my top tip for today. Start your own planty event, because if you don't do it, who's going to do it? And I'll be back next week in this busy growing season. I'm reverting to a once a week schedule for a little bit. So I will see you next Friday for another episode of On The Ledge. Bye. Bye. The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Kids by Kamiku, and Whistle by Benjamin Banger. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details. (laughs) 